When you think of V8-powered rear-wheel drive full-size luxury sedans with all the amenities, you probably think of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class or the Audi A8 or maybe the Lexus LS or the BMW 7 Series. You don't think of Kia. And yet this is a brand new Kia K900, which is a V8-powered rear-wheel drive full-size luxury sedan with all the amenities and a $60,000 price tag. This is a $60,000 luxury Kia. Now, that may not seem so strange to you at first, because I recently reviewed the new Kia Stinger GT, and that was a $50,000 Kia. But this is different for two big reasons. Number one, the Stinger GT was a sporty car aimed at young people, and they're way more likely to change their tastes and try a new brand than older people. The K900 is a luxury car aimed at the kind of people who pay with a personal check at the grocery store. The other reason this is different from the Stinger is that this is a luxury car, luxury, upscale, high-end, sport is not part of the equation here. When I think of Kia, I think of those commercials where hamsters are trying to sell me a car. Hamsters! This is a $60,000 luxury car from a brand whose best-known spokesperson is a rodent. Not surprisingly, this hasn't translated into strong sales. In the United States in 2017, Kia sold about 38 of these per month in the entire country. By comparison, Mercedes sold about 1,500 S-Class sedans per month. In Canada in 2017, Kia sold seven of these. Not per month, seven total in the entire country. If you got one of these in Canada, you show up to a car show and you say, you got a Ferrari F40? Yeah, well, I got something even rarer, a Canadian market Kia K900. Anyway, rare, weird luxury car seems right up my alley, and so I wanted to see what all the fuss was about, or at least what the limited fuss was about. So today I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the K900, then I'm going to drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And I should mention I rented this K900 here in Dallas at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport using Turo, which is this service that lets you rent other people's interesting and cool cars instead of the same normal boring airport rental cars. You can sign up for Turo using the link in the description below and get $25 off your first rental. You can also check out the link in the description below to see Turo's app. Anyway, now on to the quirks. For the first quirk of this car, I want to start with the name, which I've always found to be kind of ridiculous. Mercedes has the S550, Lexus has the LS500, and Kia looked at those and they said, no, no, we can do better than that. We're going to call it the K900. Forget the LS500 and the S550. This thing is 400 better. It's like if a child named the car. My name is Jimmy, and this is my car, and it's the Jimmy J10,000. Also, I'm sorry to harp on the name, but doesn't K900 kind of sound like a robotic dog from the future. I mean, seriously, you get K9, and this is the K900. It's like, sir, we have developed the K900. It can sniff treats from a thousand miles away. And it's also a Kia. Next up, moving under the hood, I mentioned before this has a V8, and indeed it does. They offer the K900 with a V6, but this one has a 420 horsepower, 5 liter, naturally aspirated V8, just like a real full-size luxury sedan, and that's pretty impressive from Kia. Something I like about the V8, on the plastic engine cover above the engine, Kia has eight silver lines going out from the middle of the engine just to really drive home the point you got a V8. Of course, nobody will ever notice that, but they did it anyway. Something else I like under the hood is this little warning label warning you not to come in contact with the fan with your hand when the fan is running. Take a look at this label. The person's fingers have actually broken off in the warning label. The fan has cut off the fingers. It's a morbid warning label. I love it. I only wish Kia added a little blood. That would really complete things for me personally. 
Next up, moving on to the headlights. I really love the look of the headlights in this car. They really look like the headlights you'd expect in a luxury sedan. Look at that. It almost looks like two futuristic soldiers marching together into battle. It's a cool look. Something I don't quite like is on the fender, that would be the little fender vent on the side. Not only is it sort of like a pathetic little attempt at keeping up with the fender vent trend, but of course it's fake and it dates the car and it looks stupid. One interesting item with the fender vent though, you see how it's sort of pinched in the middle from the top and the bottom? That is supposed to mimic the look of the grill, which Kia calls the tiger nose. It's pinched on the top of the bottom just like the grill and it's supposed to sort of have a distinctive Kia look to it. Next up, another extra item I like on this car, that would be the mirror turn signals. It's not just sort of some turn signal slapped on the mirror, but instead it's this nice little C shape that looks upscale and luxurious. Now, aside from that, this car's exterior is pretty pretty conservative. It's not really designed to make a splash or make some crazy statement, so there aren't really any other quirks, so it's time to head inside. I'm going to start with the door panel. Now, one interesting item you'll notice in the door panel is this little strip of LED lights down here. Now, most doors, when they're open, they have a little reflector on the side, and oncoming traffic sees the reflector, and they know that a door is open. They should be careful, but this car forgets the reflector, and it has these LEDs. Now, the weird thing about these LEDs is it's a sort of little strip of LED dots that look like they came out of a nightclub or maybe an open sign outside of a Thai restaurant. They're so weird. Now, when you close the door, the LEDs turn off. When you open them, they turn back on. Another interesting item inside the door panel would be the power seat controls. You will see the bottom part of the seat moves like normal, and the middle part, the backrest, also moves like normal. Above the backrest, there's the headrest control with only one little problem. It's fixed. The headrests in this car move manually, not with the little control on the door. It's a fake headrest control. Presumably there's some version of this car with 28-way power seats and that headrest control is active, but in this car it just sits there looking like it does something when actually it's a fake control. It has no purpose. But moving inside, back to the lights for a second. One item I find absolutely hilarious with the interior lights is that the buttons to turn on the interior lights don't say dome light or just front and rear. Instead it says front room and rear room. And when you push them, front room, that turns on the lights for the front. When you push rear room, it turns on the lights for the back. I guess Kia doesn't like to think of it as front seats. This is the, the front room of the automobile. Next up, another interesting control in this car, that would be the center screen. Now, if you look at where the center screen is placed, you can see it looks like it should be a touch screen. It's within reach of the driver. It'd be easy to press, but it isn't. Instead, it's controlled with a series of little buttons in the center console. One thing Kia got absolutely right in this car and gets right in all their cars is the font. Kia has this cool futuristic font and they use it in all of the buttons and all of the switch gear. It's distinctive and it looks cool. They even use it in the infotainment system and even the navigation system to show street names and stuff. Uh, fonts are an interesting thing. A lot of automakers will tell you, ah, oh, fonts don't matter. A button is a button and nobody cares what it looks like. But hasn't Apple proven that commercial design is something people are actually interested in? Volvo also has a really cool font and all its buttons and its gauges and every time you get in a Volvo and you look at that font it just looks cool. Whereas GM has been using the same font since like 1989 and every time I get in a GM vehicle it doesn't matter if it's a Corvette or an Escalade I can't help but thinking it looks like my grandma's 97 Buick Regal LS. Next up another interesting item in the K900. This car has a panoramic sunroof. That's not all that surprising. Most cars at this price point have one. The unusual thing is that most cars have like a little buffer that separates the front front and the rear sunroof, but this one doesn't. It's all just one big panel, which means that for those of us who are interested in the little things, we get to watch the sunshade close together and we get to watch it meet in the middle in perfect sunshade harmony. It's actually kind of a satisfying thing to watch when it does meet. Also satisfying is the sound the K900 makes when you're leaving it. You turn off the car, you're about to get out, and it makes the following sound. I don't know why it has to make a sound, but uh, it does, and that's it. Next up, we move on to the glove box, which isn't particularly unusual, although it does contain the owner's manual, which has a few interesting peculiarities, starting with this little plastic sleeve that it's in. I guarantee the owner of the car was never supposed to see the plastic sleeve. The owner's manual was supposed to be delivered in this nice leather pouch, but I guess the dealer forgot to remove it from the sleeve, and the owner of this car has never taken it out, so we get to see how Kia 
that keeps its owner's manual safe when the car is in transit. I especially like there's this little Korean writing on the bottom of it, letting you know you're not in some knockoff K900. This is the real deal. Now, when you actually take a look at the owner's manual, you'll notice a couple of interesting things. The one I noticed right away is there's a loose page in the owner's manual. I figured it just came out, but if you look closely at the page, it actually says on it, please see this page instead of page 3-6 and 3-14 in the owner's manual. In other words, this is like a supplement. They printed their owner's manual wrong and they want you to look at this instead of something else. Now, I looked at pages 3-6 and 3-14 the forbidden pages. And what I found is that actually they kind of talk about different stuff. I don't really understand why this is supposed to replace those pages. And it doesn't seem to have to do with equipment. There are items all over the owner's manual that say if applicable for features that some models have and some don't. Nonetheless, I guess Kia decided this page was better than some of these pages. It's really strange. I've never seen an addendum added to an owner's manual in this fashion before. Now, speaking of the owner's manual, I should mention that it is absolutely massively massive. It's just huge. It's one of the biggest I've ever come across. In fact, it's so big that I strongly suspect that they didn't really go to the trouble of reading the entire thing. I did read some of the owner's manual and I've found a couple of interesting errors. For example, on page 4-44 under the horn section, it says, to sound the horn, press the horn symbol on your steering wheel. Check the horn regularly to be sure it operates properly. Then the next line, to sound the horn, press the horn area indicated by the horn symbol on your steering wheel. Okay, so thanks for telling me that twice. Then the rest of the page is blank. So really, this is a high quality document and I would trust it to have every piece of information I could possibly need. Oh, and by the way, one other item about that horn page, it specifically says you have to press the horn symbol on your steering wheel for the horn to operate. It says the horn will only operate when this area is pressed. Next up, we move on to the screens. Now, there aren't as many configurable and interesting features inside this car as there are in the Stinger GT or the Genesis G90, but there are a couple of quirks. Starting with the gauge cluster screen, I really like the fact that you can adjust the service interval in this car. If you don't want the service interval to say 5,000 miles, say your oil change light comes on, you can say, forget that, let's make it 8,000 miles, and you can just keep driving with all the peace of mind that that entails. Next up, moving on to the infotainment system settings, there are a couple of interesting quirks in here, one of which is that in the navigation system settings, you can actually change the color of your route guidance line, the little line that tells you make a left turn on this street, make a right turn on this on-ramp. You can make it various different colors depending on your preference. I've seen a lot of different things that are configurable before, but I've never seen that. Who looks at the route guidance line and says, boy, I wish that were purple? Another interesting configurable item in the voice recognition system, you can choose between normal and expert. So if you feel that you're a voice recognition system expert, you can tell the car that. You know how some people brag that they're good at video games and others brag they're good at driving or whatever? Maybe some people go around telling their coworkers, yeah, I'm a voice recognition expert, no problem. Yeah, I'm an expert at voice recognition systems. I know you're just an amateur. You'd have it on normal. I have it on expert, no big deal. Yeah. Another interesting piece of configurability, there is an option to choose the image that is displayed when you have power off. The default is no image, but you can also choose a Kia ad image. I don't know why anybody would do that. Or you can choose a custom image. So if you want like a picture of your kids to show up on the infotainment screen, if you have the screen turned off, you can upload one and actually have it up there. I've never actually seen that before in any other car. It's kind of a cool idea. Next up, back to the navigation settings. One interesting item I found, if you go into guidance, you have two options, curve and merge. Yeah, I want curve and merge guidance. Fortunately, they're both checked, so I will be guided to curves and merges. I don't know why those are options. I don't know what happens if you uncheck them. I don't know what they do, but I bet I could find out in that 900 page owner's manual. And one other thing I absolutely love about the infotainment system is the little interactive guide that teaches you how to use the system. If you click on it, a little box pops up that says, we will learn about ways to use the system. Who's we? Me and the car? Me and 
I don't know, but we will learn. And we will learn. If you go through it, the system does have an interactive guide that teaches you how to use it. And at the end, it pops up a little box that says, congratulations, you have finished learning about the system. Oh, it's like my birthday. Congratulations to me. I've figured out the infotainment system in the K900. Here's one thing I haven't figured out. There's this huge screen to display the artist and the song name, whatever, but they only use about an inch of it. So it just sort of scrolls through a little at a time. Hey, Kia, why not uh, just display it all at once in the remaining 10 inches of the screen? And finally, we move on to the back seat, which is supremely roomy and comfortable. It's obviously very large back here. This is, after all, a full-size luxury sedan. And there are a couple of quirks in back, most of which are centered around the center armrest. Now, obviously, you can put it up, and then it goes away, and you can fit three people back here. Or you can put it down. You'll see a couple of cup holders right here. But the most interesting pieces are along here. Now, if you take a close look here, you will find seven total buttons, and they're all kind of interesting. The outer two buttons are fairly standard. They're the heated seat buttons for the rear seats. That's pretty cool, but most luxury cars have that. The weirdest button back here by far is on the left, and it says rear lock, and that's the button you push to lock the rear climate control, except you're sitting in the back seat. <laughs> That button should be in the front. And in fact, the front seat passengers can lock the rear climate control, but why do the rear seat passengers have the ability to lock their own climate control, especially because if they want to unlock it, all they have to do is just press the rear lock button again. <laughs> I have no idea why there's a rear climate lock button in the rear seats accessible to the rear passengers. Never seen this before? It makes no sense. Now, next to the rear lock button, that would be the power rear sunshade button. You push it, and then the rear sunshade whirs into place, just like in so many luxury cars. That's not all that uncommon anymore. Also not uncommon is the fact that this car has sunshades on the doors. Very cool, but in this car, they aren't power operated like they are in Mercedes BMWs. Instead, you have to manually put them in place. Ugh can't even believe it almost. This is supposed to be a luxury car. But the K900 redeems its luxury car status with a couple of little buttons on the right side of the rear center controls. Those would be the buttons to control the front seat. If you're sitting back here on the passenger side, you can move the front passenger seat forward to give yourself extra legroom. That's for all the people who are being chauffeured around in their K900. The other interesting button in these rear seat controls, that would be the one in the middle. It is marked K900. Now, this isn't actually a button. If you press it, it does nothing, but you can sit there and look at it and you can push it if you want just to remind yourself that you are swathed in Kia's finest luxury automobile. Now, another interesting thing back here, a very strange feature I've never seen in any other car, that would be the door locks. Now, if you want to unlock the doors, you can just reach up, you can pull the lock and that unlocks it. You want to lock it, you reach up, you push the lock, and then the door is locked. It seems simple enough, but if you go down to the door panel, about four inches down from there, you will see a little lock and unlock button. Now, in a lot of luxury cars, that button lets you lock and unlock all the doors, because if you're the chauffeur-driven passenger, you should have control over whether the doors are locked and unlocked. But in the K900, that button only controls your door. So you can lock and unlock the door manually, or four inches down from there, you can lock and unlock the door by pushing a button. And that button has no effect on the other doors in the K900. So you have two different options for locking and unlocking your door in the K900, both within six inches of each other. So those are the quirks and features of the K900, and now it's time to get behind the wheel. For more of my thoughts on the K900, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. All right, I'm driving the K900. I've been driving this car around Dallas for a couple days, so I have a pretty good idea of what's going on with it. Now, one thing I have to admit about this car, I'm a little bit disappointed with the level of equipment, which is surprising because this car's whole play is its value. It's, it gives you so much for so little compared to the rivals. But here's the thing. There's no heads up display. You already saw that thing with the weird headrest on the door. There's no touch screen. There's no by xenon headlights. There's just single xenon. There's no auto steer. Uh, this car actually has 
it doesn't quite have the level of equipment that I would want. The seats in back aren't ventilated. I mean, I can kind of go through it. There's no 360 degree camera, in fact, uh, which every luxury car has now, especially one that costs 60 grand. I was kind of thinking this would be like an S-Class in terms of equipment, but it would just sort of be, you know, it's cheaper because it's a Kia and people aren't paying the money for the brand name. But I mean, this car isn't even on S-Class level in terms of equipment it, and it costs like an E-Class and it's actually equipped like one too. So why would anyone buy this over an E-Class when the price point is the same and the equipment is the same and the difference is this one has the Kia brand name. I mean, you wouldn't, it'd be ridiculous. So that's actually been kind of a surprising disappointment with this car. I thought I'd be sitting in here and thinking, oh my God, this thing is like an S-Class, but it just has a Kia badge. And if you're willing to spend half the money, you know, and, and put away the badge notoriety, it won't matter. It's not quite like that. Now, with that said, it does have a lot of equipment. I mean, there's a lot of luxury stuff in here, moving the front seat uh, and all that. That's pretty impressive. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't go above and beyond. I think it sort of meets the expectation. Now, with that said, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I was expecting a little bit more features, equipment, whatever. I was expecting the drive to be worse than it is. I actually love how this car drives. Uh, it's tremendously smooth really just really really smooth the engine has a ton of power and here's something that really surprised me much more than i thought this car is very stable i came into dallas the other night and it was storming it was just pouring in thunderstorms the guy who i rented this car from he told me it was the worst storms he's ever seen in dallas my flight was four hours delayed i was driving it after i picked it up and it just felt rock solid and stable on the highway almost on the level of an E-Class or an S-Class, and I was really surprised about that. I was going speeds I probably shouldn't have been going given the weather, and the car was like planted, and it felt like I could have just kept going and going even higher speeds. That's not something I'm usually used to from an Asian car. Typically, it's the German cars because they're built for the Autobahn that have that sort of high speed capability, um, but this thing just felt rock solid at, at higher speeds even in bad weather which is impressive to me. And I love how the V8 feels. Um, I mean, I'm into turbo cars, the whole thing, but I think the thing I'm gonna miss the most, everybody talks about, oh, I don't want all this tech, I don't want all these features that drive for me. I'm ready for all that. What I'm not ready for is giving up V8s. This car is great proof of why you don't wanna give up a V8. The V8 is smooth, it's powerful, it's got torque, it's not loud, it just feels so good. The only thing it can't do is get 30 miles per gallon. It's just a very comfortable ride. Not much noise gets into the cabin. They've done a really great job with that, with making this car feel like the luxury car that it is, and even feel like sort of the German luxury car that it is at higher speeds on the highway, which surprised me a lot. Um, but I just wish that there were maybe a few more features. I mean, how do you not have a 360 camera? Uh, come on, you're, you're, you're telling people, the, oh, features is what we got. We got value. Well. Show me, I mean, where, where's some of this stuff? And so that's the Kia K900, the Kia luxury sedan. This thing is a complete failure. Kia has staked its entire existence on selling cheap cars to millennials, cars whose price tags end in 9.95, so they seem cheaper than they actually are. And they wanna to try to make a luxury sedan? Kia has no business making a vehicle in this segment, and I can't believe they sell this here. Then again, I probably would have said the same thing about Toyota before they came out with Lexus. And I have to admit, it's an even better value if you buy one used. Of course, that's assuming that you can find one of the 12 they sold in your local area. Anyway, now it's time for the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the K900 is fine, only fine, not great, and not bad, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 5.5 seconds, which gives it a 5 out of 10. Handling is acceptable, certainly not unstable, but steering is light and it's no sports car, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Cool factor isn't very high, but even though it doesn't have a Mercedes badge, it's still an expensive, somewhat cool car, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Importance is low. This car is important only in the sense that it shows Kia wants to make luxury cars, but it hasn't exactly made a splash, and it gets a 3 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 21 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The K900 is reasonably well equipped, but it's missing some important stuff, and it gets only a 6 out of 10. Comfort is good, the ride is nice, and the car is smooth, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is good, the interior is pretty nice, and I expect it to be reliable, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is only okay, the 16 cubic feet of cargo space gives it a 5 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and I just don't see it.
it. It's an okay car for 60 grand, but not better, and it gets only a 5 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 30 out of 50. Add it all up, and the Doug score is... 51 out of 100, and here's how it compares to some other luxury sedans I've reviewed. Of course, it's nowhere near the same price point as some of them, but it is close on price to others, and regardless, it's way behind the pack. The K900 is a car best bought used for a huge discount.